So Michael, what does this gym mean to you? It means a whole lot. Um, I've been here, what, 25 years now, and uh, that's like half of my life, and it's, it feels great to help out the kids to be champions in and out of the ring. So that gives me a lot of uh, great pleasure to help these kids to do that. So it means a whole great deal to me. And obviously you've been in this community for so long. You are born and raised here. Talk about your drive for the community and how much you love it. I love it. I mean, I totally love it because I'm still here, never left, never will. And uh, that's a very, very great feeling. And um, just to stay here in the neighborhood, uh, it's something that you can't really explain. It, 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 it's just a great feeling. What's the best advice you can give to any boxer out there? Dedication, desire, to become number one in the world. Let's talk about what is the most important attribute that a boxer needs to have? The most is, is to work hard and uh, just have, have the desire, you know? You don't have to be the most talented um, fighter in the world. If you have that dedication and desire and determination, to be world champion, you can do it. And it's not just boxers that come in this gym. Other athletes come here, right? Yes. I mean, you get older, older men. You know, we have a 72-year-old man that comes in here. We, we get a lot of people that just don't come in here to be a fighter. You know, they just come in here to get in great shape and, and get healthy and feel good about themselves. Mm -hmm. And you know Charles Barkley pretty well, don't you? Well, Pretty well. When did you first meet him? Back in 93. Like 93? When he came, yeah, when he came here. And uh, do you see him somewhat as a source of inspiration in the Phoenix community? Oh, yes. Yeah. You know him, all, all of them. All, all the athletes from here, you're talking about like Fitzgerald from the Cardinals, uh, Barkley, Marley. Um, there's a, a lot of guys. Larry Sanders was a real big from here, uh, from the Cardinals. and. There's a bunch of athletes that, that uh, you know, Diamondbacks, you know, a lot of people like Luis Gonzalez, all of them guys, and uh, all, all, the, all the athletes from here, um, that's a lot of inspiration for the kids. And uh, besides boxing, what interests you the most? Love. That's it. If you have love, there's nothing more than love. <clears throat> And I mean, like, loving one another. And that's, that's what counts in life. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think someone should be a boxing fan? If it's their first fight they've ever watched, why should they love the sport and continue to follow it? The competition. And just the dedication, desire that you see these fighters put in and just watch them compete just one-on-one, -on -one, that's beautiful. Mm. And do you remember the very first time you ever laced up a pair of gloves, or, or how did it feel the very first time you started boxing? Uh, the very first time I ever fought, I was 13 years old. I fought in a tournament, and I fought a kid that had 32 fights, and it was my first fight ever. And I gave him so much competition, I lost the fight. I was crying after the fight, and I said, I told my dad, and I said, watch, next time I fight him, I go pop, I'm going to beat him. But I don't want to say the words that I said, but I said I'm going to beat him, and that's it. I know a big thing in boxing right now, they talk about padding records, having an unblemished record, and how it's so important to not lose a fight. But talk about what you can learn from a loss and how you can improve off of that, and how it's not the end of the world. That's right, you know. That's what, what's wrong right now, is you're patting these guys' records, and some of these guys aren't really as good as you can make them, or teach them. Not, you don't want to make them, because they're going to make their sales. You want to teach them, but you're not going to be able to teach them if you just put somebody in there that you know he's going to run over, and um, what is he going to learn off of that? He's not going to learn anything off of that. 
you got to put him in there with someone that can fight, has as much experience as he does, or as many wins as he does, or at least a few wins. You don't want to go and put your guy that's about six and no, or, or seven and no, and you put in, him in with someone that's one and three. Yeah, and a lot of like that. And a lot of people, they complain about judging in boxing. The judges aren't good enough. Uh, the system could be wrong. Do they need to improve? And if so, how could it improve? You know, I can't really tell you because there's some judges that are really good and some that are really bad and really don't understand the boxing game. I think with experience, the judges uh, don't know what to look for. You know, it's just not about when you're just punching a lot, and I'm talking about professional ranks. When you're just throwing more punches than the other guy and you're not really landing the harder blows than the other guy, that's what you gotta look for. Uh, who's winning that round and who's connecting more. It's not about throwing more, because if you just throw a whole bunch of punches and not doing nothing, when the other guy is connecting with nice, solid, hard blows, then that's that. I think that's the problem with the judges. And I know Mikey Garcia. He's your favorite fighter out there, right? Right. What do you love about him? His calmness. He relaxes. The way he throws his combinations. Ooh, that reminds me of myself. Even though I didn't want to brag about that, but it's just the way he throws. You know, <laughs> there's certain fighters. You get a Sugar Ray Leonard, a Roberto Duran, uh, all these guys that have really throw really sharp punches. And I mean, there's a difference where, where I think fans don't understand. I mean, you can be quick and everything, but if you're not sharp, like just solid sharp punches, those are the ones that count. And um, you get fighters like that. That's what I love about it. Now I know you just mentioned some of the legends in uh, guys like Ray Leonard, Roberto Duran. What separates them? What do they have that's innate? You know, it, it, it's kind of hard to explain. It's the fact they, um, I don't know what it is. It's, uh, it's the desire, you know, to win and, and to be champion. And I think that separates them from other fighters. And can you talk about how important it is for a fighter, even though they may have so many strengths, how important it is to be versatile and focus on their weaknesses too. That's what, that's what you have to do. And you know, you, you really have to love, that's what you, got, you have to do, to really be great. You gotta love it. Even if you get hit, cause you're gonna get hit. You can't slip everything. You're always gonna get hit in every fight that you have. You're gonna get hit. You got to love that. I did, <laughs> even though I didn't want to get hit. But if you can't take it, then it's not for you. Yeah, I know a lot of guys, they say, hey, money and fame is everything. That's why I entered into the sport. Talk about why it's not everything. It's not. I'm going to tell you why. Because, you know, a lot of kids walk, walk in here. There's a bunch of them that came in here, and, and they say, I want to be famous, and I want to make a lot of money. Well, of course you do, but that's not why you're doing it. <laughs> if you're just coming in here to do that, I guarantee you, you will not be a world champion. Yeah, you're known as a fighter who didn't do a lot of trash talking. You certainly did a lot of your talking in the ring. Talk about how it's not always necessary to be the biggest trash talker out there, how people remember the fight more so than the press conference maybe beforehand. Well, that's true because you know what? There's no reason to talk shit. Well, uh, you know what I mean. And uh, for what? Let him talk all the stuff he wants to talk. Let him. And then you just say, we'll see. We'll see in the ring. And then you'll find out. And a lot of people, they forget about this really big fight of yours. It was against uh, Quang Sum Kim. And people forget about the magnitude of that event, how he was considered to be an enigma in Korea at that time, basically a Korean Mike Tyson. Can you talk about how big that fight was and how important of a memory it was for your career? Well, it was because he was, um, we were at the Olympics together in 88. Man, he was, like you just said, he was a Mike Tyson of Korea. 
I mean, he had so much following, you wouldn't even believe how, how many people would end up at the arena when, when he would fight. And he was above my weight class. I was at 106 pounds. He was at 112 pounds. He beat my teammate, Arthur Johnson. And uh, so when I, when I knew that I was gonna fight him, I said, oh yeah, I always wanted to fight him. I wish I was at his weight class at the Olympics, but it didn't happen. I said, it's even better now as a professional. Yeah, I know you mentioned a little bit earlier, you said winning a world title can make you a much better fighter. Why is that? Well, winning the world title, I mean, that gives you all the confidence in the world and it, it boosts your energy. Once you get in the ring, you just say, I'm not losing this. I'm not going to lose this. And that, it just makes you at least 25% with confidence men, men, mentally. And, and that's what helps a lot because if, if you're mentally confident, nobody can beat you, man. Yeah, and I know a lot of people nowadays, they may drop titles, they may move up all the time. And you were really big about winning the title and defending it. Why do you think that that precedence is lost nowadays? And why was that so important for you to win the title and defend it? Well, I, I just won the title. And uh, I took it fight by fight. Whoever you're gonna put in the ring with me, put them in. Give me the number one contenders. That's what I was telling my promoters. And I said, look, just give me number one after number one after number one. Who's ever at number two, he moves up to number one, give me him until I go down the line. And that's the way I took it. And can you talk a little bit about your friend, Big Daddy, Riddick Bo, the Hall of Famer? one of the best heavyweights of all time. And he actually took after you with the body punching. Talk about what a great fighter he is, and maybe even more importantly, what a great person he is. Oh, Riddick, Riddick is a great fighter. I mean, uh, with that dedication, you know, he, he um, see, I don't really know. I just read like everybody else, you know. At the time when he was fighting, you know, he'll blow, blow up and wait. If he had that dedication to keep his weight down, he would have been champion for a very, very long time. Cause he had so much, he could fight on the inside, he could, and he's six foot five. I mean, even his trainer, Eddie Futch, who was one of the best. And I remember uh, Riddick calling him Papa Smurf. And I just started cracking up. Riddick's one of, well, I love Riddick cause he's one of the most humorous guys out there, if you ever meet him. And he's great, man, and he was, he was a great fighter. I love him. What's probably the funniest thing he says? <laughs> Just everything that comes out of, out of his mouth, man. You know, every, I can't say that he has one funny little thing because I can remember things that he would say to everyone, you know? And uh, I can't re remember just one certain thing that he always says. And can you talk about the importance of body punching and how that can add to a fighter's arsenal? Oh man, the body punches are the best. You gotta work that body. And that's what I tell the kids here, work the body. You know, right now they're young, they, they don't understand, it. especially the younger ones, like 14, 15 year olds, they'll start learning. I said, look, you throw that right hand to the body, your left hook to the body, watch. You'll see the way he grunts and you'll be like, Oh, now I know what he's talking about, yeah. you know, and he'll start working the body after that. I know that left hook of yours, that was really vital in a lot of your fights, and it won a lot of your fights, knocked a lot of guys out. When did you discover that that was really a tool that you could use, and how did you set it up a lot of the time? It, it was just, um, I really can't tell you how, it's just all the hard work and training I did. Every time I threw the left hook, I remember my father said, just throw it real short. And see, my father's favorite fighter was Joe Lewis. He said, you throw a left hook like Joe Lewis, you'll knock everybody out. And I, I was looking at Joe Lewis's fights. He threw one of the shortest left hooks than any fighter. I mean, just, he can hit you from right here and just, blam, it'll be two, three inches. Mm -hmm. And I said, damn. And the National Boxing Hall of Fame is coming up really soon. 
Uh, next year, you're going to be inducted right alongside with guys like Chiquita and uh, Julio Cesar Chavez. How excited are you for that? I'm very excited. Two great fighters, Chavez, you know, legend, Chiquita, legend himself, and I'm with them. Hey, that's just uh, very satisfying, man. And despite Chiquita being your rival back in the day, I know you guys had three very hotly contested fights. How are you guys able to be so cordial nowadays and be such great friends and nice to one another? It's the respect. The respect we gave each other inside the ring. After that, we already knew, hey, we're friends now. I mean, he could fight, I could fight. And that's what we respect one another. That's why we, become, we became friends as we see each other. I mean, we're not real close like that, but when we see each other, you know, there's no good. I know we're about to have the 25th anniversary coming up next year of Celebrity Fight Night. Talk about how it started with you, and you were in the ring with a couple of Suns legends, weren't you? Yes. I was in there with uh, Charles Barkley and Dan Marley, and um, it was, uh, we started that Celebrity Fight Night to uh, raise funds for the gym, for this gym here, for Michael Carvajal's 9th Street Gym. And uh, all the proceeds went to here. And um, hey, and the gym's still here. That's why it helped. It helped out a lot. Yeah. And talk about what a thrill it is when you get to go back to the International Boxing Hall of Fame during the Hall of Fame week. You get to be in the marathon, reunite with all your old friends. How awesome is that? Man, that's great. I mean, you just have a whole lot of fun, you know. You meet fighters that you haven't even met or you wanted to meet, and um, it's great. But to see everybody, man, it's great. It, it, I mean, it's a very great, to be with the champions like that, that's been in the Hall of Fame, I mean, it's terrific, man, <laughs> fantastic. I know you ended your career on a high note. It must have been a thrill. And actually, as a matter of fact, even though you knocked out um, Arce back over there in Tijuana, you went back to Tijuana once again, didn't you? Can you talk about that? One time, we went back. I don't know. It was about probably a couple months after, three months, whatever. I can't remember. But one of my friends said, hey, Michael, man, if we go to Tijuana, you know, just to have fun and everything. We're not gonna have fun, you know. Nobody's gonna like you over there. They're gonna remember you whipping Arce's ass or whatever that you wanna say. And the, I said, man, no they're not. They're, they're, they're gonna be cool, watch. We went over there and had the greatest times of our lives. They were all coming up to me, talking about the Arce fight. I remember when you knocked out Arce. And I said, oh, you know, thank you for, for everything, man. And we were cool. And what was it you said to Arce in the locker room right after you beat him? He was crying afterwards. You know, he was only, what, 21, 22 years old. And I was 32 at the time. I already knew after the fight that was going to be my last fight. Because I'll tell you why. But I went to uh, his dressing room because a friend of mine they used to train here, knew Arce in there, well, because he, he's from Mexico, he's not from Tijuana, but they're from Mexico, and he came to the, he came to my dressing room, he goes, hey man, Michael Arce, Arce's in there, he's crying. I said, man, hold on, let me just change real quick, I'll go in there, I'm gonna talk to him. And he was crying, she looked at me. And I go, man, Arce, don't cry, man. You're gonna be champion again. Stop crying. I told him in Spanish, of course. And he just looked at me, he gave me a hug. And later on, he became three, four time world champion at different weight classes. I knew he was gonna be champion. And uh, I know Michael Buffer, he's your good luck charm, isn't he? Yeah, he is. You credit him for some of your wins? I, you know what, <laughs> I, just, I just love the way he used to announce. Yeah. fights and um, I remember when we were going to fight with Chiquita 
to perform. And they told me that, uh, what's his name? Jimmy Lynn Jr. was gonna announce the fight. I said, no, uh, I told Top Rank, no, you, you let Jimmy Lynn and do a Chiquita. You bring Michael Buffer in for me. Well, Michael, we never did that before. That, that's never happened. I said, well, it's gonna happen this time. I, I'm not gonna walk into the ring. I knew I was gonna walk into the ring, even if Jimmy Lennon Jr. was gonna announce me, because I love him too. So. And I know you were able to come back in a lot of your fights, right? Especially that Chiquita fight, the first one, the most memorable one in which you came back following two knockdowns. A lot of guys couldn't do that. What was it that allowed you to do that? What mental makeup did you have in that fight? First, it's, it is the mentality. That's the mentality of knowing. But you know what it is? That's the conditioning. You gotta be in great condition to take punches like that. And uh, he, the, the first knockdown was a flash knockdown. Second knockdown, I was hurt. And once I got up, I was still wobbly. And I said, I know he's gonna come at me. I gotta be careful and just cover up or grab him and do something. But he kept punching, punching, and I just grabbed him. Once I found my leg, I found the canvas because your leg is asleep. You can't feel the canvas. You know, with one leg you can, the other one you can't. It's like when you fall asleep for a long time. I mean fall asleep. When you sit down for a long time and you get up, your leg falls asleep and you can't feel the ground. That's what it feels like. Once I found the canvas, I said, you're mine. That's it. And that's what happened. And I know there was a point in your career where you had to make a comeback, right, after a long layoff. What made you know that you had something left in the tank? Oh, I knew because I wasn't going to go out with the loss. Because um, I always told my dad, I'm going to be champion. I'm a retired champion. That still makes me cry. Because, you know, it happened a long time ago. And I did it. And that's what I wanted to do. And, uh, I've always told them, I don't want to go out like all the greats. They all, all of them just stood there for too long and then they get knocked out or lose or whatever it is and they keep losing and they still think they can fight because you know what it is? It's hard to let it go, very hard. Believe me, it was hard for me to let go. But I knew that I was smart enough not to go back in there. After I knocked out Arce, I said, that's it. And was there ever a fighter back when you were maybe a kid that you really wanted to emulate? Roberto Duran. Can you talk about how you got that nickname, Manitas de Piedra? By his name, Manos de Piedra. And um, what influence did your dad have in your career? Well, he's the one who taught me, so. You know, he was an amateur fighter. And way, a long time ago, he told me that my my grandmother, my nana, didn't let him fight as a professional. I don't know if it's true or not, because I, I always say, he didn't want it, you know. But this, but in them years, you're talking about 1940s. If, you're, if your mother didn't let you fight, you're not going to be able to, so I believe him. And you still train nowadays, Michael? Well, all the time, every day, every day. What makes you want to stay after it? It's just a sense of, of belonging, you know? Just like the kids come in here, it's a sense of belonging. And you come in here. I like to train by myself, matter of fact. When I train, I train by myself. And then I come back for the, with the kids. So it's just, it's just part of my life. I've been doing this since I was 13 years old, so I can't, I, I can't let it go. And for other athletes, what do you need to tell them? I know there are a number of athletes that retire and some of them don't work out anymore. What do you have to say to them uh, in order to motivate them that, hey, it's important for your life and it's important for your health? Um, well, you know, there's a lot of them that, that I know. And they said, Mike, well, how do you do it, man? How do you look so good? How do you, you still look the same. You still look like you can fight. Well, I still work out, man. You guys don't work out. No, no, we, we, we got tired of it. And I said, well, that's why 
you're like that. And then we just start laughing. So I yeah. can't give them advice about that. That's the way yeah. they like to be. And uh, rumor has it, you cook a little bit, don't you, Michael? Always. Do some cooking? What do you love to cook, and how did that passion begin? My, my mother, just watching my mother. My mom, my mom was, a, she was always at home. My dad would be at work. We come from school, my mom would start cooking right away. And I've always watched her ever since that. I know you grew up in a household with nine siblings, was it, right? Yes. Nine siblings, what was it like? It was fun. <laughs> I know you've been an Arizona Cardinals fan for a really long time, haven't you? Since they've been here. Yeah. What does that franchise mean to you and how important have they been to the state of Arizona? proud of that. I'm still proud of them, even, they're, even though they're not winning. I remember when they didn't win any games. I was still a Cardinal fan. Still am. Always will be, as long as they stay here. I know making weight right in boxing is a huge issue. There are guys who maybe try to lose too much weight. What do you have to tell guys in order to stay on track and make sure that they stay healthy in the process? All they got to do is just Eat right. That's it. And work all the time. Just work out every day. You know, take a day off. That's what I did. I mean, I can't speak for anybody else, but I've always ate right. And uh, I've been juicing since I was 14 years old. So I think that helped out a lot. Every single morning, I drink a bottle. Of, I don't go buy the juice. I make it. I make my own juice, buy apples, oranges, grapes, whatever fruit, bananas, everything. Put them in a blender, put some water in it. You want to make it a little bit sweeter, put a little bit of sugar in it. Every single morning. And I think that keeps me healthy.